On behalf of the RSNA, thank you, you for joining us for today's webinar, the role of imaging in the diagnosis and treatment of multiple sclerosis. RSNA also thanks Cortec AI for sponsoring today's webinar. My name is Alex Rovira. I am a full-time neuroradiologist, uh, gaining my medical degree in 1983 at the University of Barcelona. I serve as director of the section of neuroradiology at University Hospital Baile de Bron in Barcelona, Spain, as professor of radiology and neuroimmunology at the University of Barcelona, and honorary associate professor at the University College of London. My main area of clinical and research interest is multiple sclerosis and related disorders. With us today, we have Professor Maria Roca, Dr. Susie Bash, and Dr. Lawrence Tannenbaum. And before introducing the speakers, there are a few things to let you know. This webinar is one of the many ways RSNA is reaching the radiology community to provide education and resources. Today's webinar will be recorded and available for free in the RSNA Online Learning Center as well as RSNA's YouTube channel. Here is the um, disclaimer uh, of RSNA. Please use the question panel to submit your questions in the webinar. And now I would like to uh, uh, introduce uh, the speakers. Um, the first one is uh, Dr. Maria Roca, she is head of neuroimaging at, of CNS White Matter Unit at San Rafael Scientific Institute and associate professor at Vita Salud, San Rafael University in Milan, Italy. Her research activity has been focused on the use of structural and functional MRI to improve our understanding of CNS function in healthy subjects and the progressive accumulation of irreversible disability in neurological disorders, mainly MS, but also vasculitis and migraine. She has authored over 520 papers and is member of the editorial board and reviewer on a regular basis for several international journals. The next speaker, the second speaker is Dr. Susie Bash. She is the medical director of new radiology at San Fernando Valley International Radiology at RADNET. Prior to this, she was on the neuroradiology faculty at UCLA after completing a two-year neuroradiology fellowship and residency also at UCLA. Dr. Bash's passion and interest lie in artificial intelligence applications in advanced neuroimaging. She is a recurring guest on TV and podcast and is actively involved in artificial intelligence clinical trials, publications, and webinars. Dr. Bash serves on the medical advisory board of several artificial intelligence companies and the editorial board for applied radiology. And finally, the third speaker is Dr. Lawrence Tannenbaum. He is vice president and chief technology officer at RADNET. Previously, he served as an associate professor of radiology, director of MRI, CT, and outpatient advanced imaging development at ECAN School of Medicine at Monsignor in New York. Dr. Tannenbaum is interested in developing applications of contrast agents, MR, CT, and advanced rendering in the clinical practice of medicine, focusing on efficiency, radiation dose appropriateness, and physiologic imaging. Um, before the presentations of the guest speakers, I would like to start things off by getting to know our audience a little better. And we will do that by asking these four questions and we would like to um, know the, the answers of your questions, of these questions uh, from all of you. Can we have uh, the questions? Well, the, the questions are, do you routinely use a tool for automatic segmentation? The second one is, uh, do you routinely use a tool for automatic volumetrics? The third one is, do you routinely use a tool for the volumetric assessment of lesions in MS patients? And the last ones, are you or your colleagues exploring artificial intelligence based applications for your practice? Please answer the questions and we will see the results at the end. Uh, 
Sim. So, let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Maria Roca, that uh, she will address the clinical needs and relevant questions like, what do we need for diagnosis uh, and what measures should we use and when in our clinical or even in the research uh, scenario? Please, Mara. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to this uh, webinar. So my task today is to discuss with you, as uh, Alex was introducing, the uh, clinical uh, questions when we want to uh, use some automated methods for the uh, quantification of lesions and atrophy in patients with multiple sclerosis. And uh, I decided to discuss with you two different uh, aspects uh, of the disease. The first is related to the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, and the second one is related to uh, monitoring disease in terms of uh, worsening of disease course or addressing possible uh, treatment uh, effects in terms of uh, response to treatment. We know that uh, for the uh, diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, uh, we need uh, to uh, demonstrate disease dissemination in space and uh, disease dissemination in time. The third main re requirement for making a proper diagnosis of multiple sclerosis uh, is uh, to rule out other possible conditions that for their clinical or uh, laboratory pattern of uh, manifestation can uh, mimic uh, this uh, condition. MRI has been formally included into the diagnostic workup of patients with multiple sclerosis in 2001 with the McDonald's diagnostic criteria. And the inclusion of MRI into this diagnostic process was due to the fact that there are some features on MRI which can be considered as typical for multiple sclerosis in terms of location of lesions, distribution of lesions and uh, evol evolution of uh, lesions uh, over time. From uh, their initial introduction, introduction into the uh, clinical practice, these uh, diagnostic criteria have been revised and modified several times over the course of the years. And I just want to remind you two major changes that have been done to these uh, criteria. The first one occurred in 2005, when the uh, assessment of spinal cord lesions was included to demonstrate disease, dis disease dissemination in space while the, the second important change was done with the, the uh, 2017 revision of the criteria when uh, the assessment of cortical lesions was uh, informally included. So at present, to demonstrate disease dissemination in space, what uh, we need to have is at least one T2 lesion in two of the four CNS areas that are usually affected by the disease, while for demonstrating disease dissemination in time, just focusing on imaging, we need to have some measures of active inflammation, so or new T2 lesions or the uh, presence of uh, gadolinium-enhancing lesion. As I was mentioning before, one of the main changes uh, to the current diagnostic criteria has been the inclusion of cortical lesion assessment. And the assessment of cortical lesions is important because uh, as uh, it has been demonstrated by several studies, it seems to increase uh, the specificity of these uh, diagnostic criteria. So uh, reducing the, the risk of uh, uh, misdiagnosis. The main issue we need to consider when assessing cortical lesions is that at present, we do not have a standardized uh, sequence for a proper recognition of these uh, lesions, even if uh, different sequences have been proposed, including double inversion recovery sequences, PSIR sequences, or the old FLIA sequences. Another question that we might have uh, for uh, concerning the diagnosis is whether we might think to develop some uh, algorithm based on artificial intelligence, which might help to have a automatic classification of patients as belonging to a given neurological condition. 
This is what we did, for instance, in this study that you can see here, where we develop a, a convolutional neural network algorithm, and we uh, compare the performance of this algorithm with the performance of two expert neuroradiologists in the classification of the four different neurological conditions, which are characterized by the presence of lesions within the one matter. As you can see from the number, the uh, algorithm, the automatic algorithm outperformed the uh, two expert neuroradiologists for all these uh, different conditions. However, there were different uh, cases of uh, misclassification also from the uh, automated algorithm. And this is important since we are dealing with the patients at the beginning of a disease where we need to make a diagnosis and we also need to make some decision concerning a possible uh, treatment. So for diagnosis, it's clear that the simple evaluation of lesion burden, lesion number, lesion volume is not sufficient. We need to integrate what is observed from MRI with the clinical and paraclinical data. Another question might be whether we might be able to identify some distinctive MR features which could be considered as a pathognomonic of a given condition. So for clinicians, it's uh, extremely important to have some practical guidelines to be able to properly identify lesions that are characteristic of a given condition and also to have guidelines for a proper application of the uh, criteria for the uh, classification of patients and for the definition of disease dissemination in space and time. Concerning the uh, possibility to identify some pathognomonic features uh, derived from MRI, the most appealing feature at uh, this stage is uh, represented by the assessment of the uh, central vein sign, which seems to uh, categorize quite well patients with, uh, to separate quite well patients affected by multiple sclerosis from patients suffering from other uh, inflammatory mediated uh, neurological conditions. The second aspect I would like to discuss with you is whether we can use different methods based on the quantification of MRI measures to try to have an assessment of the burden of the disease and also of the effects of treatment. And considering the burden of the disease, the, the measures that are currently proposed to have a sort of overall estimate of the disease-related processes that have occurred over the course of the disease are represented by the quantification of T2 lesion volume and by the quantification of the brain atrophy, which actually reflect the balance between the different pathological processes. And in a simple way, they simply reflect the balance between the accumulation of inflammation and also the uh, progressive accumulation of irreversible tissue damage and the neurodegeneration. Moving to treatment monitoring, the two aspects that are usually considered important when we start and when we want to assess the effect of a given treatment is uh, the evaluation of uh, the effect of this treatment on uh, in terms of uh, anti-inflammatory activity. And this is done usually by quantifying new T2 lesions and gadolinium enhancing lesions, and also in uh, slowing down the uh, progressive accumulation of irreversible tissue loss, so slowing down the uh, progression of atrophy. Considering the increasing number of treatment that we have and, that the, and the fact that the majority of our patients is currently under treatment, another important point that we need to consider when addressing an MRI and treatment is that we need to be able to recognize in an early stage possible treatment-related side effects. And I'm, I'm considering here not only the... Uh, the, the, the issue of uh, PML, which is uh, well known to all uh, the uh, radiologists, but also other issues that have been uh, described with some of the uh, newest treatment, uh, which are mainly related to the uh, possibility to uh, develop different forms of uh, infection. 
Considering this is burden, usually the assessment of a T2 lesion volume is done by using a, a manual assessment. This is usually considered as the, the gold standard for such a, a, an assessment. This is extremely time consuming, particularly when we have patients with a high lesion load and suffer for a uh, low intra and interurethral uh, reproducibility. This is why, as uh, you will hear from the next uh, speakers, uh, there has been the, the current attempt to try to uh, develop different uh, automated methods uh, for a proper identification and a, an automated class, uh, identification of uh, uh, lesions, uh, which can be done by using a single MR modality or by integrating different MR modalities uh, covering the, the plane in different uh, direction. And this is, is done not only for the assessment of lesions within the brain, but also for the assessment of lesions within the spinal cord. It's clear that if we want to have an overall estimate of the accumulation of the disease in our patients and of the effects of a possible treatment on this disease, we need to combine these measures of inflammation and measures of neurodegeneration. And while the assessment of inflammation can be considered as a relatively easy, since it's quite easy, easy to identify new T2 lesions or gadolinium enhancing lesions, I think that the assessment of neurodegeneration and the quantification of brain atrophy could be considered as more demanding. And if we think to include a brain atrophy quantification for the uh, monitoring of our patients, there are many, many different issues that we need to consider. There are different uh, technical, physiological, biological, and disease-related factors which can uh, actually inf influence the uh, quantification of atrophy. And if uh, we want to use a measure of atrophy to judge whether a patient is doing well or not, and whether a patient is responding or not responding to a given treatment, the main question might be what is the clinical relevant cutoff to judge this, this atrophy. So uh, to conclude, what uh, I would like to say is that uh, if we think to these automated methods, we shouldn't think to these automated methods as a replacement to the work done by the clinicians, but possibly as an integration to the work done by the clinician in order to facilitate the, the work of these radiologists and neurologists. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roca. Thank you, Mara, for this uh, uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, and now uh, we uh, will start with the second speaker, Dr. Susi Bash, who will uh, now review the clinical experience related to the use of uh, uh, quantitative MRI, including how these uh, tools uh, impact uh, uh, the efficiency and how to incorporate them into clinical practice. Susi, please. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. So yes, multiple sclerosis is a debilitating and often progressive disease that affects younger adults. So typically diagnosed between the ages of 20 to uh, 49. And you know, the difficulty is that these patients often present with a highly variable clinical presentation. So they, they really can present with a lot of different, a broad range of symptoms. And so this is why MRI plays a very key role in the diagnosis and in the longitudinal follow-up of multiple sclerosis. In fact, such an important role as, uh, as uh, Dr. Rocco was saying, it's even included in the McDonald criteria. Now with MRI, it often has a very characteristic appearance. So, you know, Dawson's fingers, colossal, pericolosal lesions, lesions along the optic radiation and in the brain stem. Uh, as you see here in the lower right, we can get that central vein sign. Um, so MRI is often, we can often nail this diagnosis with MRI. Sometimes if there's only a couple lesions, it's ambiguous, but often to neuroradiologists, this is our bread and butter. And as soon as we open the scan, we can often detect um, uh, multiple sclerosis. So the thing that I think will be very, very useful and that I find very useful in my clinical practice is quantitative volumetric imaging as an adjunct to the MRI. And so that's why I'm going to spend some time talking about 
Now, if there does remain clinical ambiguity, CSF analysis for oligoclonal bands can also be um, obtained. So quantitative volumetric imaging identifies and labels anatomic structures in the brain, and then it quantifies those volumes of the brain structures and compares that to a large normative age and gender match database. And then that allows for volumetric tracking over time to assess for a rate of change. And this is very effective in reducing subjectivity. As Dr. Roca mentioned, you know, once plaques, once you start to get a moderate or severe plaque burden, the plaques can become confluent and it's very hard to tell if there's progression. And when it comes to disease modifying therapies, that is really the most important component. Is the patient progressing and what can we do? Do we need to change the drug? So this is why this tool is extremely valuable. I've actually been using quantitative volumetric imaging in my clinical practice for about 15 years now. This is what the segmentation looks like for this particular product. There are other products out there that, you know, similar sort of segmentation arrangements. But so we use quantitative volumetric imaging for a lot of different clinical diagnoses. This is actually sort of a short list. There's a lot of products in development and other things that are used, but mainly multiple sclerosis, dementia, epilepsy, pediatrics, and traumatic brain injury. And then again, today we'll focus on multiple sclerosis. So the great thing is, is that quantitative um, volumetric imaging can identify and quantitate the individual plaques in the brain. So it can do individual lesion segmentation, as you see here, and it also can um, allow us to see regional segmentation. So this purple is showing us the periventricular plaque, so it can tell us the different locations. So in this example here, the red is leukocortical. These are the juxtacortical plaques. Periventricular is purple, infratentorial is orange, and deep white matter plaques are yellow. This happens to be the neural quant package here. Um, it also very importantly allows us to see dynamic lesion segmentation. So this is another visual display where the uh, plaques that are increased in size or new are displayed as an orange and decrease is displayed as a blue. And that's very helpful. Again, when you have uh, hundreds of plaques to allow the software to jump out in a color coded manner to let you know which ones are new and which ones are improving, um, I find extremely useful. So this is what you would see on your um, pack station, something like this, where these new or increasing plaques are this orange color and the decreasing plaques are this blue color. And you see how easily that stands out. Um, there are different reports that are used. And I'd like to go in just to familiarize people with what some of these quantitative volumetric reports look like. Um, this one happens to be the NeuroQuant MS report. Um, initially, it shows you, again, um, what the color code is for the different regions of the brain, paraventricular, juxtacortical, deep white matter, and infratentorial. It gives you a lesion summary. So it gives both the lesion count. So we have a, this patient has 96 plaques, and then it breaks it down in the locations. Uh, but even more importantly than the lesion count is the lesion burden by volume. So, um, you know, again, as two plaques become confluent, that may alter your lesion count, but the lesion burden is a, a very useful number. So this patient has 10.22 milliliters of plaque overall. It breaks it down according to location. We get the lesion burden as a percentage of the white matter and also the volume of T1 hypointense plaques. And then very importantly, we have lesion dynamics. So we get a count of which lesions are uh, new, enlarging, shrinking, stable, and the T1 hypointense. And then it tells you, the, for example, the, this enlarging lesion, it tells you how what the volume of that lesion is. And it even tells us that this particular one is juxtacortical in location. So that's all extremely useful. We also get other um, key pertinent structures. So whole brain volume, cortical gray matter, cerebral white matter, and other pertinent structures like thalamus. And so it gives us the current volume, the prior volume, if, if this is a longitudinal study, and then the volume change over time, and also percentage of the intracranial volume and then the normative percentile change. So one of the most important aspects, I think, of these quantitative volumetric reports is sort of this um, lesion dynamic summary that gives us a, a, a quick overview of what's happening on the report. So we see here that it tells us the scan date, it contained this many lesions with this amount of burden um, and involving this percentage of the white matter and it's uh, 1.45 milliliters more than what it was on the prior scan. And then it gives us the specifics of what has actually changed. Now this pre-populated sort of summary report um, you can actually bring this automatically into your PowerScribe or whatever your dictation system is. So you can pre-populate that in there, or you can cut and paste, or you don't have to use it at all. But it's a very useful tool if you want to use it, and it is included in the reports. 
um, we're also given a, a breakdown. Um, so for example, for a juxtacortical lesion, it's telling us what lobe of the brain that it's involved and also infratentorio, if whether we're in the brainstem or the cerebellum, these bar graphs give a visual analysis of this. And again, telling us what's enlarging, shrinking, stable, et cetera. Uh, we're also told the lesion burden by hemisphere. So this patient has more lesions in the left hemisphere than they do in the right. And that's displayed here by that higher volume here in the left hemisphere. And then uh, we're also given the longitudinal, a visual depiction of the longitudinal element. So the gray dot represents the prior study and the current dot is black. So we know here that the lesion burden is increasing and we even see you know, the age of the patient at the time of the different studies. Um, this is just a snapshot that the report provides of some key lesions within the brain and it shows the you know, locations. Um, and then we're given normative reference charts, which is just a visual uh, display of what I showed you earlier. So we, anything in the red is going to be greater than two standard deviations outside of the mean. So the cerebral white matter volume is uh, what we call statistically significant, more than two standard deviations below the mean. And then we see the, pre, uh, the, the trail plot from the prior study. Um, and then in, I think it's nice in the appendix here, we're actually given the current study and the prior study in the field strength that was done on. I mean, quantitative volumetric imaging really um, we want to have the same uh, parameters used on the prior study as on the current study, and we really would like a 3D flare input. If the scanner absolutely does not have 3D capability, 2D can be used, thin slice 2D, but 3D is always preferable. But it's nice to see that we're comparing apples to apples here, so I, I know what the prior study was. Um, lesion detection thresholds can actually be set by the end user, which is uh, extremely helpful. I like to use a very small minimum size because the plaques can start small. I also like to use a minimal separation. So I like one millimeter because again, the plaques can be very close together. And for the count, we don't want them to appear a confluent. And you can change these thresholds in the different areas of the brain if you would like. Um, th so that was one report. This is another report. This happens to be the ICO Brain MS report, and we can take a look at this here. Uh, uh, this also gives the uh, lesion volume here, the volume change over time, new, enlarging, and shrinking. Then we have bar graphs here that depict the time point one, time point two, and change over time. Uh, the second page of the report uh, tells us the whole brain volume, gray matter volume. And then what the what the normal range is, what the and what the normative percentile is. So this patient's at three percent for their particular age and gender. And then annualized volume change. This is what how how much volume they've lost since their prior time point. And and then the normal annualized is how much that they uh, would be expected to be lost for allowing for that time for their age and gender. Um, this report also has a pre-populated reporting template that is, again, a summary report that can be pre-populated into your own um, dictation if you would like. So one of the questions I often get asked is, um, does this do these quantitative volumetric tools enhance productivity? And we're all extremely busy as radiologists and most radiologists operate on an RVU system and we want to uh, provide the best value. These reports clearly provide uh, value. Um, but the question is, is are they going to slow us up? I mean, because th they will be much less tolerated if they're going to slow us up. So this actually has been looked into. This is a just a small clinical trial where a neuroradiologist looked at uh, 100 MRIs. Uh, half of them had quantitative volumetric post-processing and the other half did not. Um, and, and, and again, that included the pre-populated reporting template. And uh, in, in, in a timed and presented in a randomized manner from 11 different imaging sites. And it turned out that the neuroradiologist could read eight, um, uh, eight MRIs on MS patients uh, without the quantitative volumetric software and 13 with it. So 60% more reports were dictated an hour when quantitative volumetric post-processing was used. So that's very encouraging. And we like to also, on a, a RadNet where I work, um, we also like to drop on our prescription pads the, uh, a click box for quantitative volumetric imaging. And then they can just check which protocol they want to use so obviously the reports are going to look different for the different clinical indications. So they, they would just click MS. And this makes it nice and easy for our referrers um, to see it, that we offer this technology and for them to use. So as Dr. Roca mentioned, you know, there, there are specific things that we like to use for the protocol. In October 2019, the MRI Consensus Guidelines Conference was held, and that's really a collaboration of multiple stakeholders in MS patient care and in neuroimaging. A lot of different groups were represented there, and the goal was really to develop um, internationally accepted recommendations to standardize the MRI protocol for MS. 
And the most important new thing that came out of the meeting is, again, this emphasis on the 3D flare. So they really only recommend 2D, thin slice 2D, if you don't have 3D capability. Um, and then we want those displayed in both a sagittal and axial plane. And the, uh, the other advantage, not only being more, much more sensitive if you have a 3D flare, but it also can save time because if you only have 2D, you're gonna need to do two acquisitions in the sagittal plane and axial plane. But for 3D, you can just acquire, for example, in the sagittal plane and reformat in the axial plane. So that will save time. Um, they would like a, two, a T2 and a DWI, which are routine sequences that we use anyway. And then if you're considering quantitative volumetric MRI, which I would strongly always consider uh, to acquire a 3D T1, and this you can do this on any 1.5 or 3T magnet essentially. So this is a, an easy thing to acquire. The GRE or SWAN is optional for MS, but really, you know, GRE is part of the routine standard brain imaging protocol in most places anyway, and also can be useful for the central vein sign. You can see the central vein sign on flare or T2 or GRE, but it, the GRE can be useful for that. And then the other big emphasis is on gadolinium. So gadolinium is always encouraged for the baseline MRI. But then after that, you know, these patients come back every six to, you know, 12 months or so for you know, follow up studies. So after that, you know, really only if clinically indicated. So if the patient has highly active disease or unexpected clinical worsening or some kind of diagnostic uncertainty, or there's going to be a change in the disease modifying therapy or things like that, that that you really wanna use the contrast for, um, you absolutely can, but you don't need to use contrast for longitudinal follow-up. So that's another important thing that came out of that meeting. Um, another thing I'm, I've been asked before is, is it possible to effectively apply more than one AI solution to obtain the benefits of both tools, you know, while still maintaining image quality and accuracy? So a routine brain MRI often takes 30 to you know, 40 minutes, and that's including table, you know, on the table, scan time and off the table. Um, but we really would like to get our exam slots down lower. So at RadNet, we actually use 15 minute exam slots for uh, brain studies. And there are certain, we can use certain AI tools to allow us to do this. So this is deep learning um, reconstruction and it allows us in this particular case we, we, to acquire images 67% faster. This particular deep learning product happens to be Subtle MR, um, and which, can be, which is vendor neutral, can be applied to any scanner in your fleet, which is great for if a large imaging enterprise such as ours at RadNet. Um, and also, uh, so any age scanner, any vendor, but also the all major OEMs are developing deep learning uh, reconstruction or at different levels of fruition for FDA approval, but several of them already have FDA approval and it does the same thing. And so you can see this is a standard image uh, when you accelerate, the image becomes blurry and at lower resolution. And then once you re uh, reprocess this with deep learning, you can see that the image uh, quality is restored. In fact, um, higher than perceived higher than even the standard of care. So here's the original, and this is what it looks like after deep learning. Again, original, and this is after deep learning. And why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because this can actually be very useful to combine with quantitative volumetric imaging. So here we went 50% faster and then we applied quanti you know, quantitative volumetric imaging. Here are the plaques. You know, sometimes these patients have a lot of you know, symptoms and it's uncomfortable for the patients to be stuck in the scanner for long times. So this is a great thing to combine with quantitative volumetric imaging. And not only that, but this type of software increases lesion conspicuity. So you see these two white matter foci here on the standard of care. But when we accelerate and then apply uh, deep learning, we can see that these two foci are more conspicuous and, and that would be very helpful in patients with MS. And so we've looked at this through clinical validation trials and it turns out that the quantitative volumetric biomarkers are absolutely consistent even after you accelerate and apply this uh, AI software. So if the hippocampal volumes were uh, you know, two milliliters before, there'll be two milliliters after. So we're not losing any kind of information there's really no downside. So again, standard here's fast with quantitative volumetrics applied and the same thing, you know, half the time, but main, maintaining that quantitative um, accuracy. So in summary, quantitative volumetric analysis really adds value by decreasing the reader subjectivity and enhancing diagnostic um, accuracy and also really aiding in longitudinal follow-up. Our referrers really love these tools. In fact, once they start using it, I've never had a referrer go back. So it's particularly relevant to um, MS imaging. And AI tools can be combined to decrease scan time and augment quality and really preserve that quantitative accuracy. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Barsh, um, for this uh, very uh, nice presentation. It's always good to see uh, someone who has been working with these quantitative tools for so long, uh, and your experience is really uh, very interesting. So next, uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Tannenbaum, who will discuss financial considerations. Uh, he will also review uh, the key stakeholders and the future of uh, this uh, technology. Please, uh, Lawrence. Thank you very much um, to our, our sponsors. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rivera. Dr. Rivera, it's pretty clear that um, uh, age has its benefits in these circumstances. You know, when your hair gets gray, you're either going to be the moderator or have or, or or put in the position of of commenting on everybody else's presentation rather than doing the unique work. And I really enjoyed the presentations of Dr. Roca and Dr. Bash. Very informative and. Uh, you know, working directly for Dr. Bash at Radnet, I can tell you that I would echo all of her comments about the impact of artificial intelligence in terms of making uh, uh, quantitative neuroimaging a practical uh, tool in the things that we can bring to bear in the clinical setting. So I've got less time. I've got about 10 minutes to just chat about things. And uh, as is my typical bent, I decided to, you know, broaden the actual uh, discussion, because I figured that it would be well covered beforehand. And we'll talk a, a bit about how the full spectrum of quantitative neuroimaging fits into practice and what are the practical considerations, limitations, and challenges that we have to get this to be a real everyday exam. Um, as you can see, there are um, there are a lot of companies playing in the AI space, and uh, you may or may not know that quantitative imaging, while it started as a program program uh, application, this uh, program tool has been substantially augmented and enhanced by the use of artificial intelligence. And there are a lot of companies in this space. Dr. Rivera pointed out that his uh, startup is not on this slide, but I will promise you the next time I go out, Alex, it'll be right there in the middle uh, so everyone can see it. Um, Again, talking about the, uh, actually following up on the discussion that Dr. Bash gave us in terms of AI uses in radiology, uh, aside from making the acquisitions faster, um, it is essentially integral to the quality, robustness, and consistency of these tools. And frankly, this is because AI is really adept at doing things like segmentation, which is at the heart of what we do with volumetric imaging. You've already seen really nice examples of how uh, these tools can segment lesions, can segment gray matter, can segment white matter. This can give us insight into a number of different disease states. You've already heard how these tools can be applied in MS, and that is the primary focus of this presentation. But frankly, when you think about these tools, they're applied every day in the evaluation of patients with cognitive impairment, uh, uh, early, early dementia, and uh, are used in terms of uh, taking the MR examination from ruling out a treatable cause, quote unquote, that might be neurosurgical, into identifying different subtypes of, of dementia and actually assessing risk in certain circumstances. It is also a valuable tool in looking at patients with epilepsy, perhaps looking for more subtle lesions or bilateral disease. Um, and we're not gonna talk about stroke, but frankly, when you think about quantitative neuroimaging, it is the perfusion application that really was the hallmark and primary and still primary use of quantitative imaging in day-to-day -day neuroradiology. You have heard in great detail the challenges of uh, MS. Uh, you heard from both speakers that there is a challenge in interreader and interreader variability. Uh, uh, you know, anecdotally, if you show a data set with 20 or 30 lesions in it to a large spectrum of readers, you will see an incredible variation in the number of lesions and characterization of lesions. It is really tough to see if lesions are larger, lesions are smaller. Uh, it is even virtually impossible to do this as, as well as a computer can do. And that, again, is a constant theme of applying both computerized imaging uh, and, and artificial intelligence into imaging. This is an example of a patient with epilepsy. Uh, you can see the uh, volume loss on the right side, perhaps some surrounding gliosis, but yeah, is the left side abnormal? It's very difficult to tell those types of things uh, without the use of a tool uh, that is quantitative with comparison to normative databases and sensitive to abnormalities that may hide in the presence of symmetry. Other areas where quantitative neuroimaging is taking off is in areas like acute traumatic brain injury, uh, giving, you, uh, giving the clinicians uh, a real quantitative assessment as to the size of hemorrhages, the magnitude of shift, and the ventricular size in particular, uh, you know, before, after, uh, uh, and during uh, interventions. 
These tools have also been used, quantitative tools, in terms of evaluating mild TBI uh, and chronic TBI. Uh, and uh, we've seen the, the, the application of both volumetric imaging as well as things like quantitative imaging of the fractional anisotropy of the brain. Uh, an evaluation of neoplasms, uh, taking us from the known limitations of 2D measurements, as we don't do with resist type criteria, into full three-dimensional assessment. And you can actually lean on the quantitative, uh, excuse me, the segmentation qualities of, uh, of artificial intelligence applications uh, to take us from these 2D measurements into 3D measurements, and then also be able to segment different portions of the lesions, the enhancing portion, the surrounding T2 prolongation, uh, the central portions that don't enhance, which may be necrosis, and use this to assist in the quantitative and more precise and accurate assessment of patients and lesions on an ongoing basis. I think one of the greatest potential applications or you know, burgeoning applications of quantitative imaging is evaluating the ventricular system. I can't tell you how stressful it is as a neuroradiologist to assess whether the ventricles are a little larger, or a little smaller, say, be, say after clamping of, of a catheter, uh, uh, and, uh, and then walk into the neurosurgical meeting and, and, and watch five neurosurgeons second guess my assessment. Well, isn't the temporal horn a little bit bigger? You know, isn't there a little more shift? It is really nice to be able to rely upon a high quality, consistent, and essentially unbiased tool uh, to make these assessments. And uh, you can see how this might increase quality, but it's certainly going to increase consistency uh, and reliability over time by removing subjectivity. So frankly, my goal was to talk about, and my assignment was to talk about some of the practical considerations that are keeping these tools from becoming everyday, uh, 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 everyday aspects of our armament. What are the practical considerations that stand in the way? Well, first of all, let's look at the, stage, the stakeholders here. Uh, aside from the patients who benefit from these technologies, we have the neurologists who will impact the patients with uh, cognitive impairment. Uh, the focus of this presentation, diseases that are, are progressive and chronic like multiple sclerosis, as well as uh, difficult to detect and characterize like epilepsy. We also have neurosurgeons, which will impact on some of these cases, uh, certainly the epilepsy cases, uh, the acute traumatic brain injury cases, but also cases where we're looking at surveillance of mass lesions, whether malignant or benign. Uh, we know meningiomas are very common. Uh, it can be very difficult to assess them, uh, assess subtle growth because 10% in any one plane is very difficult to perceive, but 10% in all three planes is really a big deal. And frankly, um, uh, much better assessed with computerized technology than we do uh, visually. And I've already alluded to the the, uh, the use in the ICU where patients are being evaluated uh, generally uh, around, the, around the incidence of neurosurgery. And then again, where radiologists start uh, uh, you know, is really an interesting part of this pathway. Uh, while we are the ones who use the tools, because of a number of practical considerations, we need to be enabled and encouraged to, by our, the other constituents to put these tools to day-to-day -to -day work. So what are the barriers to keeping these tools from becoming standard of care, becoming expected and included on every examination when they make a contribution? Well, certainly would they need to be validated? Uh, and frankly, there's a reasonable amount of validation out there in the literature. Um, they've certainly needed to be improved and there's been an enormous amount of improvement over time with more reliable segmentation uh, and uh, you know, augmented by tools like uh, deep learning and machine learning. Uh, and I think we're at the point right now where we really have the best quality and the best consistency we've ever had. Uh, most of our focus has been about the field of dreams model. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with field of dreams, it's the radiologist radiolog has been told, build it and the clinicians will come. And, uh, you know, in other words, make the tool available and uh, the, you make the better mousetrap and the world will be, to, be this path to your door. Uh, but frankly, that is not, has not been as, as successful as we'd like. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is the clinical acceptance and awareness in the fields of the uh, physicians who actually ultimately get the best benefit of these tools. And the neurologists need to be aware that these tools increase the value of the MR examination in things like multiple sclerosis uh, and, and epilepsy. Uh, the neurosurgeons need to be aware that we have tools that will take the subjectivity out of assessment of ventricular size that will actually translate what the images show into the guidelines that they use to determine outcome and treatment plans in acute traumatic brain injury. 
And the value of these tools uh, in the longitudinal assessment of lesions that the oncologists and neurosurgeons see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, ultimately, ultimately, we need to convince these physicians of the value of these tools so that uh, because just building the tool doesn't seem to be enough, uh, making the tool available doesn't seem to be enough to get these tools into day-to-day -day practice. So what are the limiting factors other than awareness in the clinical sphere? Well, the other limiting factor is, you know, the payment models. How do we pay for these tools, right? And there are a number of different models out there. Uh, these tools all started with use the report once, we'll charge you the charge, and you'll go ahead and figure out how you get paid. Um, and, uh, but it became very clear that with the array of reports, it, it's very difficult to prospectively figure out which one you need. So it became, over time, easier to get the vendors to go ahead and send you a variety of reports under a single charge so that you could go ahead and bring the best value to bear. Uh, it has taken a while to figure out which products are best, which ones we that are most user-friendly, the most reliable, and the ones at hand. Um, but fundamentally, you know, the payment models can vary between uh, per click, per number of reports, or uh, essentially access to anything in the product portfolio that may be valuable in these circumstances. Uh, the uh, models have shifted over time into circumstances where maybe you would subscribe for a year uh, for uh, either limited or unlimited access of a single tool or a variety of products. So we moved from the per click model into the model where essentially we just sign on with a vendor and make these tools available. In the per click model, you can certainly see the limiting factors in terms of making this real and every day. In the subscription model, you, all, you start to become tempted to saying, are there insights that we can get from these tools on every case? The limiting factor here, however, is these tools come with a charge and it is challenging for us to apply a tool on our own volition if it indeed increases the cost of the examination. And ultimately, we need help in these cases. First, we, it is better if we have the awareness of the clinicians who will then place the order, which would then justify the increased cost of the examination. This is difficult to do in at least the US uh, economic environment uh, to add a cost without the urging and validation and, uh, and request from the referring clinician. So it goes back to, you know, the field of dreams model doesn't work. We need to get the order from the clinicians. And then ultimately, whenever we add cost to an examination, we'd like to find a way to get reimbursed for that cost so that we don't have to hand this cost over to the patients. Because really the two options are commercial payers, uh, you know, government-based payers and out-of-pocket payment, uh, payment. And in our experience, there is some payment from commercial payers at this particular point in time, uh, some circumstances where the payer won't pay. We know this up front and we ask for out-of-pocket payment. There is no dedicated CPT code for volumetric imaging. There is uh, you know, widespread use of codes that are adopted from other applications. Uh, but these are not you know, specifically legitimized, specifically endorsed by any, uh, by any of our societies or organizations. So ultimately it isn't the ideal solution uh, for, what we, for how we go forward. So ultimately we need for these tools to be used, to be requested. We need the radiologists to be aware of the benefits of these tools and put them to work. And Dr. Bash did a wonderful job uh, uh, describing the benefits in terms of increasing reliability increasing workflow, uh, uh, and incre ultimately increasing the value of the examination without affecting any of our, any of our throughput. So um, we've talked about a lot of different things, and we'll certainly have a preform discussion on all of these. I tried to give a broader application of the, a broader discussion of the application of quantitative neuroimaging. Uh, I think all of the three speakers, um, uh, certainly the other two speakers did a wonderful job uh, talking about the impact of these tools. And I tried to focus on how do we get to the acceptance in both the radiology community and even more importantly, in the clinical community. So the neurologist will ask for this examination. The neurosurgeons will expect this examination. Uh, and ultimately, I think as the utilization increases, becomes more common. And uh, we need to focus on a way of getting more consistent payment for these examinations. So that's the end of my formal presentation. It was an honor to participate in this forum, and I look forward to some of the interaction that will follow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh...
Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, uh, for this uh, presentation. And uh, I think that we have uh, around 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, but before that, uh, I think it would be interesting to see uh, the results of the poll that we made at the beginning of this uh, webinar. Uh, we ask you uh, four different questions. Uh, uh, the first one is, do you routinely use a tool for automated segmentation? It seems that uh, uh, around 60% of the people say no, they don't use it uh, uh, routinely. Uh, also for uh, uh, the question about the use of uh, uh, automated volumetrics, uh, the similar results, uh, almost 60% they don't use this kind of tools. Um, the third question was, do you routinely use a tool for the volumetric assessment of lesions in MS patients? And also 60% say no. And finally, the, the last question is, uh, are you or your colleagues exploring artificial intelligence based applications for your practice and uh, similar results, uh, but in the other way around that 60% of the people is uh, saying yes. So I think that uh, the results are, uh, I think that are quite good in the sense that uh, around 40 people, 40% 40 of the people are using some kind of tools as the ones that you uh, mentioned during your presentations. So good, uh, interesting uh, results of the of the poll, um, and then uh, I have uh, several questions from the audience. But before starting with these uh, questions, I have uh, uh, a couple of questions, uh, and the first one is um, uh, I would like to address the question to to Dr. Roca, um, and I know I'm aware that you've been using a quantitative MRI based measures for a long time, but particularly for research. But um, what do you think, what is the limitation that you see as a clinical neurologist in the uh, implementation of these uh, tools uh, in clinical practice? Um, okay, um, if we, we, thank you for the question. If we think to implement these uh, tools in clinical practice, I, I think it's uh, important to uh, differentiate uh, the, 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 um, the type of patients we want to study. So I, I think that, that there are many different issues when we want to implement these tools in clinical practice. The two main points is that we need to have a standardized acquisition protocol, as it has been uh, already uh, said by uh, Dr. Bash, it's important that uh, the patient is studied on the same scanner with the same sequence in order to be able to, to apply this method. And this uh, is uh, usually difficult to be obtaining clinical practice, at least here in Italy and in uh, Europe. I, I don't know if in the USA is, uh, is different. Uh, the other point is that it might be difficult to implement this tool in the, the diagnostic workup of patients with MS uh, because uh, this might result uh, in a, a, a even increase over diagnosis of MS uh, because uh, we, we need only two lesions uh, and these, uh, these tools will, uh, will detect much, much more than the two lesions uh, needed to, to demonstrate disease dissemination in space or time. So it will be extremely important uh, to perform a careful integration of uh, the results obtained with uh, this tool uh, with the results obtained from clinical evaluation and from other laboratory testing in order to try to control for this uh, risk of uh, overdiagnosis. Thank you. Um, then I have uh, one question from the audience uh, uh, that I think that uh, should be addressed to uh, Dr. Bash. Um, and uh, also fits quite well uh, with the comments made by uh, Dr. Roca in the sense that uh, how do you report uh, the, the volumes or the data coming from these uh, automatic tools? How do you integrate uh, these uh, atrophy measures together with your visual assessment of the scans and your interpretation based on your experience and knowledge. So you combine both or, uh, or in other words, how do you manage the, the false negative or false positive results that you can get from these tools? Okay, yeah, so that's a, a great practical question. Um, I break my report into two sections. So one is just the MRI interpretation alone. So I, I first interpret the MRI, uh, you know, without looking at the quant tool. Then I have a second section of my report that has the quantitative volumetric imaging section. And in that I put the plaque burden and then the change and also where the plaques are primarily located. And so all of those components are added under a separate paragraph. Um, the, as we were talking about, you know, quantitative volumetric imaging is only as good as the accuracy of segmentation. But, you know, I, again, I've, I've been using this for about 15 years and I see the different iterations as the um, versions um, improve over time. 
we are now at a place that um, the segmentation is actually very good. And you know, most of the segmentation can be done with machine learning, although there are, uh, there are some um, in, in some areas that deep learning can be used as well to even improve the um, accuracy of the segmentation, particularly in the um, infratentorial region and juxtacortical regions, which are because we use a flare input and sometimes lesions in these locations are better visualized on T2. Um, but in general, the segmentation is, is very good at, at this stage. Um, at least with the leading companies that are out there right now. But, you know, as you've mentioned, you know, it's not it's not a perfect science. So sometimes there can be a false positive or false negative. Um, if I if I think that there is something really relevant, I might add that into the quantitative. You know, it's just sort of a sideline um, that there is. But in general, the the plaque burden um, is does tend to be accurate um, in terms of because I can visually see the segmentation. And really, probably what's even more important than whether you have the perfect amount, uh, a perfect uh, volume every single time is that you are accurately depicting change over a uh, longitudinal study, because that's really what the neurologist needs to know. So let's say there was one false positive. If that, if you reprocess using the same protocol and the same scanner, or, and it doesn't necessarily need to be the same scanner, but it should be the same protocol. Um, then if, it, if there is another false positive at the follow-up time, we're still getting the information that we need to know because we're it's telling us overall if the lesion burden has increased. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question, a uh, very practical question that I will address to Dr. Tannenbau. And the question is, um, how expensive are these tools? We know that in certain countries, uh, it's not so easy to to um, to receive reimbursement for these uh, assessments, uh, and uh, and therefore it's uh, really difficult to implement these uh, these tools. So, um, any comment on on the cost of these uh, additional tools? I think that uh, also we need to consider. I would like to know your opinion. Uh, the, the cost of these tools in the context of the cost of a mess of a mess in general uh, treatment uh, uh, in in these patients. So. What is your opinion on that? Well, it's, that's a whole bunch of questions. So let's not forget the last question. Don't let me leave without the last one because I think the last one is really uh, the more interesting one. Um, these tools have a cost. The short answer to this question is too much, right? Everybody would agree to that. Everything costs too much. So let's just say that. Um, and you, what folks may not know is it, all of these things tend to have different prices in different countries based on what the market can bear. An MR scanner in India costs a lot less than an MR scanner in the US, even though it's the same scanner. Um, so I really can't comment. It is a relatively modest cost in the US. You know, I would say maybe 10 or 15% added on to the cost of the MR examination if you were paying for it, say, out of pocket. Um, and But that will vary. And frankly, it's varied over time. If they cost more earlier on. Now that they're being used more widely, the cost pressures and and frankly, the economies of scale have made the prices go down. Uh, certainly, one of the limiting factors before this becomes standard of care will be an even lower cost. But right now, I would say the costs are manageable. Now, the reason why I thought the last question was so valuable, and it really plays into your relative discussion of versus the cost of the of the treating patients with MS, I commented already about it, against the cost of an individual examination, is about value, right? When we, we always talk about value, quality over benefit, you know, cost over benefits. Um, if the MR examination does not identify new lesions adequately, does not assess lesion burden, does not impact the treatment of a patient, the value of that examination is therefore zero, okay? It has no value. If I miss lesions, if I can't do the critical assessment, if I can't uh, assess the brain atrophy that may be progressing, um, it has zero value. So by adding this capability to the examination, uh, augmenting and increasing the functional uh, benefits of radiologists alone to radiologists and machine, uh, the value goes up, you know, in an infinite fashion. So frankly, um, the cost is modest, although variable. The impact is substantial, almost as much as to add value where there is none without the tool. And frankly, that's the way we look at it. So it would be wonderful to get reimbursement. This will be regional. It will be uh, regional on a worldwide basis. Um, as will the cost, but ultimately, uh, I think patients are better served, uh, the clinicians who treat them are better served, 
uh, if we find a way to get over those limitations and integrate these tools when they're necessary in clinical practice. Thank you. So I think that uh, it's almost uh, time to finish this webinar, but I think still we have some time for, a, for a, an additional question. And, and this is also a very practical one. And, and, and I, maybe I can ask this to, to Susie is, uh, uh, what about um, your experience in the uh, reproducibility of this uh, uh, volumetric uh, quantitative data uh, when you use different scanners? or when you are using different tools, because if you want to compare, for example, if you use uh, tool A and compare to uh, assessment made in tool B, are there different, are there are any study that compare how uh, robust are the different tools available? What is your experience on that? Okay, so my experience of that is, first of all, the, the leading companies are working very hard to make sure that their um, algorithms are trained to be robust against different scanners of different models. So it's really not so much the scanner the patient goes on. We do try to direct our MS patients to our 3T scanner because we want to always make sure that we have that 3D flare input. It is, it is very problematic if you're comparing a prior study that was done with a 2D flare input. Um, it's slightly thicker slices possibly, and then they come for a follow-up with a 3D flare because the 3D flare is going to detect more lesions. So that's going to impact the volume. The volume will be higher on the 3D. So, but as long as you have 3D flare inputs on both or you're matching the same, you know, then it really doesn't matter as much what scanner they go to, as long as that protocol remains consistent. And another uh, component of that is that these versions get better over time. You know, every year or so, the, the, the leading companies will release new versions and they do a better, even, even better job. Again, we're at a point now where the segmentation is really outstanding. So, but what you wanna do is you don't wanna just look back at the prior report and say, okay, my volume is, is eight milliliters now and the prior volume was six milliliters. I can see it on my PAC system from two years ago. What you always wanna do is have the text push the prior study, uh, the pertinent sequences. So they'll push the 3D flare and the 3D T1 to through the portal, through an, uh, the, the cloud portal to the company that they're using. And then that prior study gets incorporated and reprocessed. You push the prior first, then you push the current. And then that gets reprocessed and combined together in one current report. And the reason why that's essential is because now both the prior and the current are processed under the current version of the software, which is gonna be a better version than the previous version. And so that's, that's extremely important for the, just the technologist to know that that's how we do it. That's it's much more accurate way of doing it. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think that uh, also it's extremely important, as you already mentioned, to, to follow a, a high quality um, uh, standardized MRI protocol. In that fact, I would like to recommend you uh, the recent uh, guidelines and recommendations published in Lancet Neurology by different groups in North America and in Europe. I think it's, it's really important to follow these guidelines. And with that, I think that we can really uh, improve the, 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 the output uh, provided by these uh, tools. With that, I would like to thank uh, today's uh, faculty for sharing uh, your experience on, on this uh, topic and Cortex AI for sponsoring today's webinar and also to our audience. Thank you, you also for attending today's webinar and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much to all. Thank you. Bye.